in family practice. I was trained in family practice in emergency medicine, and uh, I, I drifted as a result of life events into more of the functional area. Now I'm focusing, really focused on environmental medicine. And that's what I've been doing for about the last 10 years, 12 years now. And the vast majority of that has been revolving around molds, metals, and the 112,000 different chemical toxins that we've been exposed to, or are potentially exposed to in the course of our breathing air, drinking water, and eating food. Yeah, I saw that you took an interest in mold after you had a bit of a mold experience yourself. Uh, yeah, that kind of kind of attracted my attention rather abruptly. Uh, what had happened is I had been in the ER for 22 years and uh, had a car accident on the way home from work. And being a card carrying member of the Church of the Medical Orthodoxy, I you know went to the neurosurgeon and the neurologist and the physiatrist and had the trigger points and the epidurals and the long and short acting narcotics and the muscle relaxants and the anti-inflammatories and everything else. And nothing was really working. So they said, well, we'll do a percutaneous disc decompression. And I said, great, surgery always works where medicine fails. And they did that. And I felt great for about two weeks. And uh, actually, it was more like a week. And then the pain just got progressively worse and worse and worse. And it ended up that I had a, an infection in the disc and the spine as a result of the procedure and ended up on six weeks of IV antibiotics. And by the time I was done with that, I actually felt worse than when I started. And I just happened to run into a guy that I used to work with in the ER who had started an anti-aging practice. And he said, uh, Mike, let me give you some IV vitamin C. And I went, Mark, I thought you were a doctor. And he said, well, I am. What have you got to lose? And so I rolled up my sleeve. And after about the third infusion, I went to open my car door. And I realized for the first time in over two and a half years what it was like not to be in pain. And that got me thinking. It's like, what didn't they teach me in medical school? And so I went and I began my journey in the functional medicine. And I started a practice in around 2009, you know, doing what functional medicine doctors do is fixing hormones and balancing gut flora and doing all that wonderful stuff. And I found that about 20, 25% of my patients just weren't getting any better. And I, I just was sitting there and I, I became very curious during this time and kind of wondering, well, what, what else am I missing? And I happened to see an ad for a course in environmental medicine that uh, Dr. Walter Crinion, who unfortunately is now uh, passed, but he uh, did an environmental medicine training for physicians. And I did that and, and I went, wow, this is what I've been missing. This, this, is, really, this is really kind of the crux of, of the matter. And from that group, the concept of deeper healing uh, and with a large component of the reasons that, and looking for the reasons that we get sick because there's lots of ways for us to be sick but there's not that many ways for us to get sick and if we just are curious enough to ask why is this happening then we can get to the results for fixing the problem as opposed to what we're stuck in now is just bailing our leaking boat uh, which bigger and bigger pails of pills or even supplements instead of finding the leak and fixing that. And so often the leak revolves around the environmental impacts or the, the impact the environment has on our health in adverse ways. And if we fix that, then we can, you know, to me, I tell my patients every day, find the leak, fix the leak, then worry about bailing the boat. If you, if you try to just, if you're just sitting there bailing the boat, your arms are going to get tired. You're going to need bigger and bigger pails of pills or whatever, and you're, you're still going to sink. So my idea is let's keep you afloat. Absolutely. So I looked over your videos and I saw that you had uh, read Dr. Shoemaker's work. And what, what do you think of uh, his techniques? Well, I, I, you know, I, I have a great deal of respect for anybody that's willing to put himself on the line for what he believes. Um, I just don't necessarily believe that his process is the only way to fix a mold problem. Uh, and, and I found that on my own, you know, going back to your original question, I'm, I, I tend to get sidetracked sometimes. <laughs> so that's fine. Reel me back, reel me back in, you know, <laughs> but, um, you know, when I, when I originally had my own mold illness, I was, I was actually sitting in, in a clinic 
And I, my brain fog was so bad, I could not remember what it was I just asked the patient that was sitting across from me. And I went, well, I was attributing it to, you know, uh, my adrenals were shot because taking the traditional functional medicine approach, my adrenals were shot. I sold a practice. I moved halfway across the country. I started a new thing. I'm trying to create a new and different, you know, I'm just, I'm just tired. And then I was walking into this, uh, the sub-basement area one day after a rainstorm and I noticed all these water leaks. And I went, you dumb son of a gun. <laughs> You've had all this training and, and you, you, you forgot to apply it to yourself. And I did some testing and realized that I actually was suffering from mold illness, not from a, well, adrenal fatigue is a consequence of mold illness. And um, so I started wondering, okay, who do I need to go see? Because at the time there weren't a whole lot of people dealing with mold. And Dr. Shoemaker was one protocol and I was sitting there kind of going, but you're treating an infection of staph in the nose when the problem is mold. So how is treating with an antibiotic going to get rid of a fungus? So that was the first thing that kind of got me thinking. And then I came across Dr. Brewer's work in Kansas City. And he, he, he was an infectious disease guy that looked at uh, uh, over 100 chronic fatigue patients he had. And he tested them all. And they all had, you know, the vast majority had mold toxins. He treated the mold to uh, toxin presence with amphotericin and EDTA or EDTA and another or nystatin or eritricotin, some antifungal along with a biofilm disruptor as, as, an, uh, as a nasal atomizer. And I said, that makes sense to me. Uh, but then I was thinking, well, that, that gets rid of the mold, but how do you get rid of the toxins? And I came across articles about the, the, the absolute necessity of glutathione and getting the toxins out of the body. And so as a result of, again, trying to be curious and figuring out what was wrong with me, I, I came across a protocol that, that I put together that worked for me and has variations on it have worked subsequently for the vast majority of my patients. And so that's what I do. So uh, does that answer your question? Is that, is... Yeah, yeah. And um, the uh, Brewer protocol is very reminiscent of the Dr. Marinkovich from the 1990s. We used itraconazole and um, you know various yeah. uh, nutritional uh, dietary interventions and chromalin mm -hmm. as a mast cell inhibitor. Yeah, and it was it was fascinating, you know. And and you know, I, I kept I kept going back. You know, look, you look at the ENT literature from that time, and it was very clear that they all the, the literature was there that said if you have chronic sinusitis, you got a fungal infection but they kept throwing antibiotics at it. And I'm kind of like, do you guys even read your own literature? I mean, what? Yeah, Jens Ponikow from the Mayo Institute yeah. kind of turned the whole paradigm upside down. Yeah. It was uh, chronic rhinosinusitis being a, a fungal infection rather than a bacterial one. Yeah, and so what do they keep doing? They keep throwing antibiotics at them. Well, you know, come on guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's fascinating that once a concept becomes embedded, it's very hard to dislodge it. It is, it is. And, and you know, and you know, there's a couple of things that brings to mind. And again, if, I'm, if I get off track, please reel me back in. But you know, in the course of the last 12 or 15 years, people will keep asking me, well, doc, how come more doctors don't think like you do? And I go, well, you know what basic training is? And they go, well, yeah, yeah. So they, they, and I say, yeah, they take a citizen and turn them into a soldier in eight to 12 weeks. Well, when you figure four years of medical school and a minimum of three years of residency, you've had seven years of basic training and you, you lose your desire, if nothing else, to ask questions. It's, it's you are taught this is how you do it and this is how you think about how to do it. And you end up doing it that way again and again and again. And, and it's just, it's very hard to break that habit. It's very hard to break that paradigm. And so part of our, what I consider part of our current healthcare crisis is, starts with how are we educating our physicians? And if you think about that for a second, you know, we're taught to bring a patient in, listen to their symptoms and give them a diagnosis. And they feel better because the diagnosis, they, that validates their symptoms and, you know, they're not crazy. And it helps the physician because then they now have a checklist of medications they can use to help treat the symptoms. 
and then he hands the prescription to the patient. And the patient goes to the pharmacy and fills the prescription and the money goes to the drug companies who then funnel some of that back to research grants to the medical schools that are teaching the medical students. <laughs> and, the cycle, and the circle is complete. Yeah, I've and often that, made that same comparison. Exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. Where, uh, in the uh, military, there's a system and you abide by the system. When um, information comes through to a, a sentry, it gets passed to the officer of the watch and then up through various echelons to the appropriate place. And you don't discount the information. You don't uh, have a choice about whether you pass it on or not. It's your duty mm -hmm. and you do it. Exactly. And, and as a result, we've lost our curiosity. As physicians, we've lost our curiosity and we're satisfied that the diagnosis is the disease. And it's not. The diagnosis is just a, a name that we give to a constellation of symptoms that we then try to obviate in the hopes of preventing or, or, or fixing the, the underlying process, which it never does. Yeah. Yeah, treating the, the name as if it were the disease. Yeah, yeah. And, and, that's, and that's what I'm trying to overcome. That's, that's, that's the big barrier. So I feel that if you look back on any of these acronym names, and it doesn't matter which one, it always starts with a narrow and discrete entity, a data set. Mm -hmm. And the person that coined that name has specific reasons for doing so. Otherwise, why have a new name? Mm -hmm. So if you go back and you look at what his reasons were, then you know exactly why that name came into existence. That works for fibromyalgia, Epstein-Barr virus syndrome, Lyme disease, doesn't matter what. Yeah. That's, that's science. Yeah. And, and to me, you know, things like, you name two of them that I run into on an almost daily basis is, you know, Lyme and Epstein-Barr. Uh, it's always preceded, I have chronic Lyme or I have chronic Epstein-Barr. And I say, no, you don't. You've got a screwed up immune system that's keeping your body from controlling the infection. Let's look to the reason why your immune system isn't working, fix that problem, then worry about the bug. Because until then, if you don't change, Louis Pasteur had it all wrong. <laughs> it's, it's not, it, it, it is the bug, but it's not just the bug. It's the bug that the environment finds itself in. As you have, you, you have a movie theater full of people. You dump the same H1N1 or COVID-19 or whatever you want through their ventilation system. And you go check and two weeks later what's happened. And you've had a couple of people that may have died and you got another half dozen or so people that may have ended up in the hospital. And then you got on the other end, you got a dozen or so people that like, was I exposed to something? And, and you've got a whole range of symptoms in between. If it was the same bug for the same length of time, why weren't we all sick in the same way? Because our immune systems are all competent to different levels. And if you don't pay attention to what's the underlying issue, you are never going to solve the problem. Sorry. Yeah, that's exactly how I looked at it. Um, so, are you familiar with the history of chronic fatigue syndrome? Uh, well, I, I, I know that we started using that term back when I was in residency uh, because it seemed to work better than uh, reactive hypoglycemia. <laughs> but as to the exact history, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the exact history. Well, I'm a survivor and participant of the uh, original chronic fatigue syndrome cohort. And uh, I played a direct role in the creation of the syndrome by serving as its first prototype. Really? Yeah, I, I was the absolute first one. And uh, that tends to drive people a little ballistic because I, I, my God, chronic fatigue syndrome is so big now. Who are you? How dare you say such a thing? Well, I'm happy to meet you. I said, tell me about your experience. <laughs> yeah, um, a dramatic loss of ability to keep Epstein-Barr virus in restraint went through my little village, Incline Village on the North Shore of Lake Tahoe. And all of a sudden, people were just lighting up with uh, glandular fever, uh, mononucleosis. The uh, adults, normally it's the kissing disease. Yeah. You know, people get the kissing disease and they recover and then they have lifelong immunity. All of a sudden, adults who weren't messing around, who weren't swapping spit, <laughs> suddenly are getting this reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. So we were kind of forced with the um, decision to make is, is this a new type of Epstein-Barr virus? Is it like a mutant? What's going on here? And it turns out that it was actually a drop of immune function. Mm -hmm. 
if yeah. people uh, had a new exposure to EBV, then they had difficulty putting it back into latency. But if it had been, you know, kept in restraint by a immune competent, healthy, you know, host, all of a sudden they were no longer keeping it in restraint. The uh, Center for Disease Control was so concerned about that that they sent some epidemiologists out, John Kaplan and Gary Holmes, and um, they looked at the EBV serologies and they go, yeah, something's going on. These people are, they, they can't keep it under control, but we don't know why. So at first they decided that uh, it was just diet and stress, poor lifestyle, uh, toxic overload, just unrelated factors. It was just something that happens, but nobody knows what, and they plan to ignore it. But new evidence came in. We found uh, a new, newly discovered virus involved. Uh, it's now called HHV6 alpha. It's a herpes virus that was previously unknown. And it has a really incredible B cell destroying effect, which is exactly the opposite of Epstein-Barr virus because EBV immortalizes cells. It causes them to proliferate. That's, that's what the mononucleosis, the monospot test is for, mm -hmm. to detect this B cell proliferation. And all of a sudden we've got a problem here because people are showing up with no B cells. Total loss of them. This is obviously not chronic Epstein-Barr virus. So the CDC was forced by this finding to abandon the EBV syndrome and create a replacement. And since I was a prime example of this HBLV or HHV6 phenomenon, Dr. Paul Cheney asked me if I would serve as its first representative. And in total, he found 19 of us. By the time of the Holmes Committee um, convening in 1987, he had found 19 of us. So we served as the core basis for why this new syndrome was being created. So if you chase back chronic fatigue syndrome to its very beginnings, it really has some good evidence and things that we can study. It's not just random fatigue that happens to anything, anybody for any reason. And in this group, a most amazing thing, people tended to recover, just as you say, from that flu-like illness that went through. And the people that didn't were all in moldy buildings. Mm -hmm. Every cluster of the original chronic fatigue syndrome cohort were in a moldy building. This was noted at the time. If, they, um, if people were in a healthy building, they sailed through this flu-like illness, no problem. You know, maybe got sick for a little bit longer than the average person, but they tended to recover. So when this chronic fatigue syndrome was coined, it was based solely on the chronic cases. You know, that, that's why they put it right in the name. It's the chronic malady, mm -hmm. the people who don't recover, and at the time, chronic uh, mold, toxic mold had not been discovered yet. They didn't know, it wasn't even in the human medical literature at all. Not in the radar. <laughs> so when they wrote up the definition, it was with the intent to find the mystery virus. Mm -hmm. And later on, as we identified toxic mold in all these buildings, they wouldn't uh, allow this to be reinserted into the the data set into the entity that chronic fatigue syndrome was coined to find. So I, I saw on your, um, your video and uh, in your blog that you were regarding chronic fatigue syndrome as a misdiagnosis of mold illness. Mm -hmm. When actually mold illness is what chronic fatigue syndrome was coined to find. Yeah, actually, yeah. And I kind of go round and round with Dr. Shoemaker about that because he keeps saying that it's a misdiagnosis of SIRS. No, <laughs> SIRS is a manifestation of mold illness. I'm sorry. Exactly, like, yeah. SIRS is also a manifestation of, you know, of, of toxic metals and overburden. It's a total body burden of environmental toxicants. You take your pick of what, what flavors you happen to, to choose from. Some people like me, I grew up in Northwest Ohio. I had coal-fired power plants. We put mercurochrome and mercyolate on all our cuts and scrapes. You know, uh, we drank out of uh, 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 
water hoses that were lead lined. We, we, you know, we had leaded gasoline, we had leaded paint, you know, we had a, I was a, I was a walking, you know, um, uh, I was a walking super fun site as far as metals were concerned. Then they threw mold on top of that and I really crashed and burned because the thing that people don't get with an environmental and, and this is one of the problems we have with medical research is we focus on one thing. We're looking for that one virus. We're looking for that one cause. And it's very seldom just one thing. It's always about everything. It's always about our total body experience. It's always about our total body burden. And you can call it whatever you like, SIRS, call it, but it's, it's, it's always about the dysfunction that occurs on a cellular level as a result of our inability to for me, my current, my current belief is, is and how deeper healing came about, is that if you ask the question, well, why is it broken? Why is it not working? It's always, people keep coming back to, oh, it's inflammation, you're inflamed. You know, how many times, you, oh, cancer is, is an inflammatory disease, heart disease is inflammatory based, whatever, it's inflammatory based. Well, where does the inflammation come from? And you kind of go, well, Inflammation is another word that we use in, in tandem with oxidative stress. So then if you ask the question, well, where, what's, what causes oxidative stress? And I, I'm reminded of a, a, a lecture that I heard from uh, Dr. Tom Levy back at a Reardon Clinic Cancer Symposium years ago. And he was sitting up there and he had all the slides and it was all about, well, if you're not a reducing agent, you're an oxidizing agent. And if you go back to basic chemistry, and basic biochemistry, and, and even uh, Dr. Uh, Zent Yorgi uh, was, was talks about this. It's, it's, it's just all about ion transfer, and reducing agents can donate an electron, and oxidizing agents can accept the electron. And as that electron bounces from point A to point B, that's what turns all our biochemical wheels. That's what drives our Krebs cycle. That's what drives our oxidative phosphorylation and our mitochondria. And if we have an imbalance in there, either because we don't have enough reducing agents coming into our system, or we have an increased demand on the oxidizing side, we create oxidative stress. That results in inflammation and things start to break. It's, it's really kind of stupid simple. Yeah, I see a reflection of the work of Linus Pauling and Dr. Robert Cathcart. There you go. And, and if you look at, well, where do you get your reducing agents from? Well, you only get those in the food you eat. You can't get them in the, in the air you breathe or the water you breathe. You, you can't, they, they don't, they're not created de novo. You have, to, you have to take them into your system. So if you, you, you can eat the best diet in the world, but still have oxidative stress if you have an increased demand on the other side. And where does that increased demand come from? Well, I just kind of, for simplicity's sake, I characterized it as the, as the EEP of deep, of part of deeper healing. Your emotional status, how often are you pulling the fire alarm in the brain? You're doing that more, you're more in fight or flight, you require more energy. Environmental factors, and this is a rock nobody wants to look under because nobody knows what the hell to do about it. Yeah. Or great confusion about what to do about it. Yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, and then lastly, physical, what's already wrong with us? Well, if you're a middle-aged woman and you're going through perimenopause, there's hormone disruption. Your hormones are your cellular messengers. They, they're telling your body what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and if they're out of whack, you're not going to work right. You're going to increase your oxygen demand. You're going to increase oxidative stress. You're going to create problems. So it's always about everything, but generally there's usually one thing that pops up and more and more and more and often and on a daily basis that that thing that keeps popping up is the environmental component. And more and more and more of that time, it turns out to be mold as, as a factor. And if you look at why, well, if you figure, you know, just rough estimates, I know we have more than 350 million people in this country, but say we have 350 million people. Half our buildings in this country have some sort of water damage. So now we've got 175 million people at risk. Of that 175 million, you figure 20% or, or, or roughly 35 million are going to have a sensitivity to mold that makes it impossible for them to live in a moldy building. Well, now I've got 37 million people, or 35 million people, they're walking around there sick and not knowing why, and thinking that they're crazy because they're going to the doctor, giving them this constellation of, of a broad range of symptoms that nobody can figure out, and they write them a prescription for Prozac and say, go see the psychiatrist. And that's not helping, because they're just trying to bail a boat without fixing the leak. Yeah, we seem to be uh, perfectly in line on this. Certainly, what happens to you is the sum total of your 
uh, background, the, the overloads, the exposures that you've had in the past, everything plays a role. But at the same time, I'm reminded of how when doctors converged on us from all over the world to try to solve this mystery illness, the CDC, I mean, researchers everywhere were reading about it and trying to solve it. And they were trying to put it into a, a framework of toxic overload. And the problem with the toxic overload was that every time we try to draw attention to the mold, they would say, well, it's misguided to focus on any one thing because there's pesticides, there's phthalates, there's, uh, you know, PCBs, there's all this other stuff. VOC, and yeah. <laughs> I say, well, you know, none of those factors changed. Uh, we're high mm -hmm. up in the mountains, pristine lake, Lake Tahoe. I mean, it's beautiful as it gets. And there was no pesticides, no agriculture. N mm -hmm. Nothing had changed except this black mold started growing. Mm -hmm. So how about we just attach some importance to this one thing just long enough to see if we can get some value out of it? Yeah, it's always about, it, it, it is always about your total body burden. And, you know, it, it's, I, I tell patients every day, you know, while you can usually identify the straw that broke the camel's back, your camel would have been perfectly fine had it not been for all the rest of the straw you was already carrying. And, 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 but it's, it's foolish just to focus on, you know, it's, it, we got to, we got to peel, particularly when it comes to environmental illness, you got to peel the onion to take the most important thing first. And oftentimes that tends to, I, I tell people until we fix the mold, we're not going to get anywhere else because the mold toxins, well, let's, let's back up a little bit because there, there's three ways that mold can affect you. There's, there's three types. There, there's mold that will cause you allergic symptoms and more than, certainly more than 35 million people have that problem. And they just, they get the sneezes and the runny noses and the congestion and things like that. Then you have the mold toxin illness, which is more or less what we're talking about here, where it really is impacting the immune system or in the case of ZRL and can act as a big hormone disruptor because it's an estrogen mimic. Uh, or or um, it'll hit you neurovascularly, which is, you know, the brain fog and the aches and pains and the autonomic dysfunction, the POTS syndrome and all this other stuff that comes along with it. But then they also have the, uh, the pathogenic mold. So some of the, uh, some of the, uh, some of the aspergillus species that actually will, will, will generally hit immune compromised people can, but can hit immunocompetent people with just chronic sinusitis and you'll get an invasive aspergillus growing and it will literally eat your bone or cause cavitations in your lungs and it will, it will literally kill you um, directly as opposed to the indirect effect of the toxins or just you know, sneezing while you're driving your car and running into a you know, pylon or something. Um, so there's, there, there are these three different manifestations of mold illness. Which of the, the one, three is most common in your office? The most common that I see is, is yeah. mycotoxin illness. A lot of the people that, you know, they're, the people with the allergies are the folks that are running around and they're going to see the uh, ENT doctor and getting scratch tested, which to me is a waste of damn time. But <laughs> that's, a, that's another conversation I'll be happy to get into if you like. But um, you know, they're, they're taking their antihistamines and they don't, they, they don't think that, you know, there, there may be something else they need to do, like maybe get their house inspected. Yeah, at the time the chronic fatigue center was coined, when Dr. Gary Holmes was writing his definition, allergists understood an allergy. You could be tested for, for mold allergies. They, they, in fact, that's what caused them to not look at mold toxicity because they were so convinced they already knew everything there was to know about allergy. And they knew about aspergillus and uh, blastomycosis type mm -hmm. infections, mm -hmm. uh, coccidiomycosis, they were aware of that. So in order to get a chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis, if you look in the criteria, it actually says that mold fungal infection must be excluded. And that, that means aspergillus must be excluded. Mm -hmm. So if you actually follow the directions on the criteria and weed out all these other things, the allergies, the, the infections, what was left? And that's what Gary Holmes was intending to do is like weed out all this other stuff and what's left. Well, by the time we got rid of all the viruses, all the infections, all the things that we didn't know about, the only thing that was left was mold toxins. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it, it's not just aspergillus. I mean, aspergillus will make ochratoxin and aflatoxin, which can be can, can be devastating. But what about stachybotrys? What about fusarium? What about chitomium? All of which can can make the trichothecenes, which are the only mold toxin that has ever been weaponized for military use. And those were exactly the ones that we found in the clusters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's and I see I see stachybotrys or I see trichothecenes on somebody's you know lab panel I like I freak out <laughs> I'm just like this stuff will kill you dead or a damn doornail. Yeah, you can see this poster behind me. Yeah, chronic trichothecene exposure may be indistinguishable from chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, yeah. And well, that and that's what and that was Brewer's original work. He took you know 104 CFS patients and treated them and did the mycotoxin test. They said, oh look, like 96 of you are positive. Treated treated them all, and the vast majority got better just by treating the mold topically, not even getting rid of the mold toxins, which is another issue because once you have the mold illness, you got two problems. Well, three actually. One, you have to have a safe place to live because likely you picked it up from either the place you live or the place you work, which by the way, may have been as much as 15 years before you actually come to see me and get diagnosed. You have the problem of colonization or potential colonization, usually your sinuses, possibly your lungs, possibly your GI tract. And then you have the issue of how do I get rid of the toxins? Because, and this is, this is the tricky part because the toxins you have to have, I don't care what Richie Shoemaker or anybody else says about you got to use binders. Binders are not going to get the toxin out of the cell. You've got to have glutathione to get the toxin out of the cell. But the very presence of the toxin inhibits a GCLC critical, this is an enzyme that is used that you have to have in order to make your glutathione. And as a result of just the very presence of the toxin, you can deplete your glutathione production. You can downregulate your glutathione production 60%. And so with any ongoing exposure, whether it's colonization or ongoing exposure in your atmosphere or your environment, you are reducing your body's ability to get rid of the very thing you have to get rid of by 60%. So you're gonna run out of that stuff pretty quickly. So how in God's holy name are you going to fix the problem without getting rid of the toxin? Well, I remember Rich Van Kenijnenberg used to uh, constantly try to figure out ways to increase glutathione in the methylation process. The and only way you can, make, you can increase glutathione is by taking glutathione because your body can't, you can take all the NAC you want, but it's that very enzyme that keeps the NAC from being attached to the glutamine and the cysteine in order to, or I mean the, uh, the glutamine and the, um, uh, glycine, glutamine, and cysteine, the, 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 to attach to the glycine and glutamine to make the glutathione. But I was uh, in contact with Dr. Thrasher and Dr. Brewer when they were working on that paper. And it was very unfortunate that they wrote the connection to chronic fatigue syndrome in a speculative way, as if they just found it in their patients. Mm -hmm. It would have been much more helpful if they had said, well, actually, this was the clue that started the chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. Could have cleared up a lot of confusion. Yeah, and but and, and at the same time, though, they probably never would have gotten the paper published. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. Um, a good so we have to remember going back to that basic training thing. You know, <laughs> doctors' minds are changed very slowly, and uh, uh, and what, what, there, there was another there was another saying about that. I I, I I'm going to get this wrong, but it goes something about you know uh, uh, initially. Uh, you'll, you'll scoff at data that will come to be believed that will then become like, well, this has been the truth all along. So <laughs> you go from disbelief to, uh, to dogma uh, in stages. And if you, if, if you present what clearly to you may be dogma as, as anything but disbelief initially, you're probably not going to get very much of a following. Well, so my story is basically in four of Dr. Shoemaker's books. So. Um with great detail in Mold Warriors and Surviving Mold, where I've been trying to get the word out that uh, toxic mold actually was the very first clue in the mm -hmm. malady that came to be called chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. So once people know that, then that gives them the direction on how to regard this in terms of their own illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
and yeah, and, and really, you, you, if like I said, if you don't if you don't deal with the mold, if you don't have if you don't balance the oxidative stress, um, you're never going to get better. Things will continue to break. Well, back before there were any mold doctors, um, all there was was avoidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we started educating ourselves about how to detect mold and what measures we needed to take in order to avoid it. For example, other members of the, um, these clusters that I talk about, they realized that they could no longer work in these buildings. So they went to work elsewhere and they realized there were certain buildings in town that they couldn't go in. Mm -hmm. And over time, these people had such a miraculous recovery that they didn't qualify as having chronic fatigue syndrome anymore. Mm -hmm. And they'd go back to their doctors who would say, well, that's just a fluke. You probably got better for no reason. You're just taking care of yourself. Yeah. Uh, and, and many people will get better by avoidance. But, however, if you've been colonized and you have this continuous low-grade remanufacturing of mold and mold toxins, then you're, you, you, may get, you may improve, but you're never going to be cured or better. Yeah. Well, one thing that's on this poster behind me, is that when this phenomenon uh, emerged in the 1980s and they started looking around for patterns of who recovered and who did not, it was people who were in the presence of the trichothecene producers who mm -hmm. tended to suffer permanent damage, who were left chronically hypersensitive. Mm -hmm. So that's why I attach particular importance to Stachybotrys, Fusarium, and the other trichothecene producing molds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do too. I, I see it, and I I, I just like I, I don't go into panic because I and and you know I I generally do just so you're looking for the mycotoxins, and if I see any mycotoxin, I'm not happy uh, because again, it, you don't have to have a lot of any if you happen to be sensitive to it. If, if your body can't process them, you're not going to do well. I don't care what your level is. Um, uh, but there's there's I've I literally have have in the last. 30, 30 plus months that I've been doing basically mycotoxin testing on anybody who walks in my office. So probably out of the last 800 patients, I can, I, I've got a handful, quite literally five or less that, that have not tested for some type of mold toxin. Now, how many of them are, they have not been all equally sick, but if you if you come to me with, with with any of the chronic fatigue symptoms or the migrating pains or the brain fog or the sudden change in anxiety or sleep disturbance, and you have any level of mycotoxin, we're dealing with that first. Because so the I question is, how much of long COVID is actually mold illness? Oh, dude. <laughs> 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 about 35 million cases by my reckoning <laughs> I mean, and how, many, the, how, how much chronic Lyme is, is mold how much I mean the reason now they're, they're saying oh well if you got chronic Lyme you got you know mold is associated with chronic Lyme no mold is the cause of chronic Lyme just like mold is the cause of chronic fatigue just like mold is the cause of you know put whatever chronic you want in front of it and go to right now we have myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome institutes all over the world that are talking about the studies they're going to do, the comparisons they're going to make, how they're going to find the mystery virus, the latent viral infection that is the cause of long COVID, and none of them are talking about mold. I know, it drives you nuts, doesn't it? <laughs> it's crazy I, making. I, I, I just, you know, I, I don't know when we lost our common sense, but uh, I just, you know, I, I just, I, I've gotten to the point that I just kind of look at it as job security. I mean, just like, I, I would, I would go nuts beating my head against the wall, trying to, to think of it in any other way other than your, your stupidity is my job security. You know what, Dr. Bowerschmidt, I'm so glad that you said all that you said. Like, we're literally going to take that clip and we're going to shout it at the rooftops on our page. Because that's what we always talk about. This is what mm -hmm. we, I mean. This is what Eric points to every single covers conversation, yeah. and that's why he feels like it's important to talk about the history of chronic fatigue syndrome. Because it's like there's so many doctors that are just either in denial or they're being malfeasant. And at this point, 
they're being malfeasant. Uh, you know, the MF, ME, CFS community is just leading people to their deaths, literally. Mm -hmm. And this is terrible, terrible that mm -hmm. they're not being helped when we could just figure out, okay, are, you know, is this, is this a connection to stachybotrys? Have you, let's check for mycotoxins. Let's get you out of the moldy environment and see how you feel. It's just such a simple answer, but we're so stupid that we're not implementing this. And so many people are suffering and dying as a result. Yeah, exactly. And you know, how, how do you get that across to people? I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I've been trying to do it one patient at a time. Um, but now I've, I, I, you know, I, I am, I, I did. I was given the opportunity to do a grand rounds with um, uh, Lynn Patrick. I don't know if you know Dr. Lynn Patrick. Uh, she was Walter Crinion's uh, protege. Uh, Walter Crinion taught me environmental medicine. Uh, but uh, she, as I mentioned, Walter uh, unfortunately is no longer with us. But Lynn, Lynn picked up the the mantle and has continued his uh, environmental medicine education for physicians. And I was. You know, I spoke with Grand Rounds on mold, and, and it's, I've gotten phone calls about, can, can we come and see what you do? We want to know what you do. And so I, I have hope that, you know, people are at least finally waking up and, and, and putting one and one together as two as opposed to 11. And kind of like, okay, we don't, we, we don't have to have a convoluted mystery virus uh, to explain what is evident from toxicology. I mean, you, you have a mold toxin. We, the mold toxins, along with any other environmental toxins, the, the basic pathophysiology be, behind this, and this is Dr. Von Arden in, in Switzerland came, came up with this concept that he, he knew that environmental toxins would interfere with uh, blood flow to the, to, to, to the cells. And it does so because there's, a, there's a, a functional valve at the end of the artery as it enters the capillary. And that valve opens and closes every few seconds, every few minutes to allow time for the nutrients and the oxygen to, uh, you know, to cross the cellular membranes and get in and, out in and get into the cells. Absent that valve, if it was, just op it was just a totally open system, it'd be like trying to empty your freight train without stopping at the station. You're not, you'll get some of the stuff out that you need, but probably not enough of everything you need or exactly what you need. But what happens when that, that valve becomes dysfunctional is the red blood cells can't get by. And this is one of the primary issues I have with, with doing things like, oh, we're going to take this supplement to help you do this or help you do that. It's, it's fine. You've gone from, from regular gasoline to premium gasoline, but you've done nothing about giving yourselves the spark plugs they need to ignite the fuel to turn on the pumps to dump the toxins. So oxygen becomes a very important part of healing. Um, so say you get the oxygen, and I, I have a program that I use to reestablish that blood flow. And I use this in conjunction with the glutathione to dump the toxins and, and eradicating mold in the sinuses. And, but then you have, okay, the toxins are out. Many of them, like volatile organic compounds, the care you mentioned, and, and you know, P, uh, PCBs and many of the uh, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are too big to be picked up on the venous side of the capillary bed. They have to be picked up by the lymphatics. Well, you've got to do something about lymphatic drainage because otherwise it's just like I've taken some grease and dumped it down my kitchen sink drain and I expect my, my water to drain properly. So you know, drain the lymphatics. Now you got all this stuff back into your circulation and you don't want to overwhelm your liver and your kidneys, so I use a sauna to help people. And sauna has been demonstrated time and again to help people with environmental illness in general. Um, and so it's, it's just, you know, if you, if you think about how, not only what is causing the problem, but how it's causing it, and deal with this battle on two fronts, get rid of the toxins, kill the source of the toxins, dump the toxins, you know, and, and then you've got a chance at healing the body. But until you do those things, until you identify the tact, until you come to the realization that please God, please let some people start realizing this, until you come to the realization that the mold toxin is the problem and do something about it, you're never gonna get better. I don't care what you have. So the idea that we can restore ourselves to perfect health and go in and out or even live in uh, these mold infested buildings with impunity is really a false construct. 
Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, once you're mold sensitive, you're always going to be mold sensitive. I mean, you you got sick to begin with more. So I've I've had families of five come in, and one of them is just like death's door, and three of them have the allergic symptoms, and one of them sitting around going, "What's wrong with you people? I'm fine." And they're all living in the same building. Why? Same principle as you know, you got a, a, a theater full of people and you dump a virus in there. Not everybody gets sick in the same way because everybody's immune system is different. If you've got great glutathione levels and you can dump the toxin and your immune system is is spot on and, and can keep the mold from, from colonizing your sinuses, you're in great shape. But if you live in a moldy building, you're sooner or later you're gonna get sick. You know, it's just any any mold in, with long enough exposure is going to become toxic. Yep. Us and our pets. That's and our pets, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and there, there are things we can do to make it easier for you that if you accidentally walk into a moldy building, that you're not going to become as sick as you were. But I still, you know, I, I had stachybotrys, I had the trichothecenes, and it cost me five laparotomies because I couldn't, I couldn't heal after surgery. I kept having recurrent infections and problems. Yikes. Until I finally figured out that, geez, it's mold toxins might have something to do with this. Um, you know, I got rid of those. I, uh, you know, I, got, I healed. But even now, uh, I, if I, you know, I live in South Carolina. There's lots of big old plantation homes and gardens and open for public viewing. And uh, I walk into some of them and I turn right around and I walk. I smell that nice earthy, earthy musty smell and I am out of there in a heartbeat uh, before I get sick. I've had other patients that, you know, they're here, they're healing, they go downtown, they go down downtown Charleston, the peninsulas, you know, 1700s, you know, lots of mold. Uh, they walk into a building, they kind of go, gee, I don't feel a little funny. And they buy, you know, one woman bought, bought, bought a, a, a clothing and brought it home. And she, like within 48 hours, she was back from where she started from two weeks prior. And she had been doing so well. And it was like, darling, <laughs> You can't go back in those places, you know. You yeah, that's how it is. But yeah. you know, just as a uh, sentry has an obligation to tell his platoon, and you know, his platoon has an obligation to tell their officers, and the officers have to, you know, pass it on to the upper echelons that there's an impending threat. You know, there's an attack. There's mm -hmm. there's something coming. I feel that doctors have a responsibility to do the same, and if they know that there's a, a threat emerging, such as toxic mold illness, that they shouldn't just keep it to their platoon or tell their, their, their buddies about it, they need to take it to the authorities. Yeah, I'm, I don't disagree with that at all. I've, and I've done everything I know how to do, like coming on podcasts and trying to get well, that's, that's my and That's my goal patients. with, that was my goal. In fact, that was my goal when I agreed to start the syndrome is this will create a meme. This will make it um, information that people will pass on because it's important to the understanding of why this chronic fatigue syndrome even exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, and, and people oftentimes ask me, well, well, how do I know if my house is moldy? Well, oftentimes you don't. Uh, I mean, your nose is a good is a good indicator. If, uh, as I mentioned, if you have that musty smell or that good earthy aroma to one of your rooms or your basement or your call space, you got mold. I don't care, you know. It reminds me kind of like the, you remember Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy and says you might be a redneck if? Oh yeah. Yeah, well it's kind of like you, you, you might have mold if you have a water stain on your ceiling. You might have mold if your air conditioning is not sized right for your house. You might have mold if you've got flex duct systems. You, you might have mold if you've got leaky windows. You might have mold if, you're, if your irrigation system is bl blowing up, is, 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 is sprinkling your foundation instead of your yard. You might have mold if your gutters aren't, uh, aren't right sized for the, for, for the weather patterns you're in. You might have mold if you've got a few shingles blown off your roof. I mean, there's, there's a whole list of things. You might have mold if you haven't, uh, if you haven't tightened the, the fittings on your washing machine. Uh, you know, if you might have mold if you've got uh, where your pipes are coming through your, your walls and up to your sinks and your tubs if they haven't been, if, if they haven't been insulated and sealed. Um, you know, any you know place... the, worst, the worst thing about uh, trying to look for mold by trying to make a correlation with symptoms, you know, like headaches or rashes or fatigue, is that stachybotrys, the trichothecenes, they're protein synthesis inhibitors. They mm -hmm. shut off immune function. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you're exposed to this particular mold, what may be really damaging to you is not the overt symptoms, it's just a failure to respond to infections. 
Which brings us back to the chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Epstein-Barr, let's look for the virus, the chronic Lyme. Why is, why is, why is, I, after antibiotic, after antibiotic, is my Lyme under control? Is because your immune system isn't working, you big dummy. Exactly, yeah. That's it. Simple <laughs> as that. It is. It's, it's like, it's, it's simple stupid, you know. <laughs> I think what's sad is when people go to their doctor and then the doctors prescribe them anxiety medications and beta blockers and all these random things. And it's just like, this is a toxicology issue, as you mentioned, and you're just mm -hmm. further retoxifying the individual that is already mm -hmm. having a hard time getting rid of the toxicants that are already harboring in their body. It's just, it's it, to me, it's murderous, honestly. Maybe I'm being extreme, but well, it, it makes not, me sad. Yeah. It's it's not it's not murder like I just stabbed you with a knife. It's 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 death by a thousand cuts. Uh, and you know you, you take the, the the polypharmacy. You know you, you start taking you, you start taking the uh, you, you start taking the NSAID for your arthritic condition, and then you get gut disturbance. So they put you have diarrhea. So they put you on an antibiotic, and then they put you on some Lomodal because you're having the diarrhea, and then the Lomodal causes constipation. So then you get the Miralax, and the Miralax is drug after drug after drug. And it's the same. It's, it goes back to the analogy of the boat. Your boat is sinking, and they're giving you a bigger and bigger pail of pills to help bail your boat without fixing the leak. You gotta look for the leak. If you don't find the leak, you're never you're gonna sink. You just you may you may take it a little longer to sink with with a bigger pail, but you are going to sink, and you're gonna sink sooner than you need to. So you know, look to the diet. Look at when when people leave. I have a, a program where people come to stay two to four weeks and just to try to get them pulled out of the hole and dusted off and said, "These are your problems. This is what you need to do to fix them down the road. It's gonna you're not gonna get better in two to four weeks, but we're gonna figure out what's wrong and teach you what you need to do to get better." And invariably, six months later, eight months later, they call up and say, "Hi, I'm feeling bad again." I go, "Okay, what's changed? Your diet? What's happened? You know, have you changed your diet? Have you gone back to eating crappy foods? You know." Uh, emotionally, it, it, the kids causing a problem. You're getting a divorce. You know, you're you know, you got a wedding to plan. You know, what's happening? Environmental. What have you been exposed to? And this is a this is where the people. This is 99 times out of 100. Well, you know, we took this trip and we stayed in a hotel, and uh, and I didn't think about it. But now that you mentioned it, yeah, I saw some paint peeling from around the window. <laughs> you know. Or lastly, physical, you know, what, you know, if you had an intercurrent infection, well, I, I, I got COVID and it crashed my immune system. And, and, or, or worse, I got the vaccination. Please get another vaccination. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, this has been such a great conversation. And uh, I'm sorry that I've really dominated it this way. I'm sure Keely must have some questions for you. Uh, She's always puts on a really good rant. <laughs> I don't really have any questions. I've just enjoyed listening to you. You're a more open-minded doctor than some that we've spoken with in terms of looking at, I don't know, being receptive to hearing some of the things that Eric says. We kind of see that when medical doctors you know, we, we suffer from a type of sensitivity that's not currently explained by anywhere or anything or any research, you know, when you've been, I don't, I'm sure you see this in your practice, but we've been sensitized to the point where, I mean, when I had contaminated objects from a moldy home in my current home, I actually walked into the kitchen once and I was like, this kitchen table has to go because of how mm -hmm. quickly it can, it can flare me. And so you know, that points to some mechanism of a reaction that's not quite understood. And, you know, our team is interested in looking at the bottom of that and speaking honestly about it and addressing it honestly for the mold injured population. And when we bring these things to doctors, they try to like doctor explain us of like, well, this is what it is and it's immune system PTSD. And it's like, hey, listen, if this was all figured out, <laughs> this would be like all figured out and we're telling you that it's not. Huh. And I, well, some, some of it, you, you, you hit an interesting 
topic, Haley, is why, why do we maintain the sensitivity? And it, it does have to do with the immune system. It's not a PTSD reaction. I mean, anytime you have been exposed to anything, we have these memory T and B cells that are there. They're supposed to be our protection against recurrent infection against the same, you know, with the same thing. That's why, you know, primary immunity for things like measles, mumps, and chicken. You know, I, I had all those things when I was a kid. We, you know, my first vaccination was... Uh, I stood in line in second grade and, and walked along a table and picked up a sugar cube with the polio vaccine in it and, and had it. And that was, that, that was the only vaccine I had when I was in second grade. So I didn't have anything until I was seven years old. Um, but the, the idea is that when you, you know, so I had the measles, the mumps, rubella, I still have viral antibodies. I have antibody titers that are, that you can find in my blood at age 67 from stuff I had when I was seven and eight years old. That's that's the purpose of the immune system is to remember it. So if you are re-exposed to it, you don't get it again, you know. Or if you get it again, you have you can you can mount a, a response quicker. Your sentry has been notified. The platoon leader has been notified. You, the the sergeant and the and the and the lieutenant and the captain and the, all the way up to the general, you know, knows and knows what they need to do to mobilize quickly, to 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 you know get that invader under control. So is that the same body's response that would have a reaction to a toxin? Because I, I hear you I hear you having an explanation for pathogens, and I'm wondering if it's the exact same mechanism. Yeah, it's the anything. You can be sensitized to anything. Uh, another classic example is the uh, metal on metal, uh, the metal on metal implants that they used initially for hip replacements and knee replacements. You know, initially they, they had all these failures because the, the implants would become loose. But what actually happened is the grinding of the metal on the metal reduced this microscopic sizes of the metal that the body responded to, created antibodies to, and then started eating away at, at, at the implants as they went into the bone and loosened them up. And they said, oh, well, we didn't do a good job the first time. Let's take them out and put in the same one, only we'll use a stronger glue. So yeah, your body will sensitize anything that is not self. Yeah, I'd like to back up just a little bit here because yeah. you brought up the uh, concept of immune programming, how T and B cells have a memory mm -hmm. and that memory dictates the cytokine cascade, how aggressively mm -hmm. the immune system will respond. And many doctors, they believe that this is a dose response, a dose relationship. Mm -hmm. they... <laughs> mm -hmm. You're wrong. No, let me cut you off right there. No, it is not a dose response curve. It is, if you get exposed, your immune system is going to go, it is, it is like the rocket sitting on the launch pad. And it's either sitting on the launch pad or it's going into space. There is no low where it's just going to taxi down the runway and take off slowly and climb to altitude nonsense. Those of us that have been sensitized, all you need is light the fuse, babe, and then stand back and enjoy the ride, or not enjoy the ride, as the case may be. So it, when we refer to this as a toxic problem, we really have to make it clear that it's really an immune program oh, yeah. to mm -hmm. unbelievably low levels, minuscule amounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once you've been sensitized, it doesn't take much. Now, there are processes that you can use to try to desensitize. I, I personally like LDA or low dose antigen therapy, which is it, it's designed to upregulate the T regulatory cells so you don't have that over exuberant response from the Th1 or Th2 or Th17 process. As opposed to, I mentioned, you know, you go to the ENT doctor for your allergies, and why I don't like that is because what you're doing there is trying to create blocking antibodies. So imagine for a moment you've got a riot going on in your body. Traditional immunotherapy would have you come in once or twice a week for multiple weeks and getting ever increasing doses of the things you're sensitive to in an effort to let your body get used to it. So it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to let a few more rioters in and just so I know how, how much I have to strengthen my walls and put how much more barbed wire I need to put up and, and things. Well, the LDA therapy works differently by exposing you to a variety of antigens simultaneously that upregulate your T regulatory cells, which from an immune standpoint is like bringing in the National Guard and getting rid of the rioters. Just like, hey guys, you don't have to react so strongly. We're gonna, we're gonna take you off the launch pad and put you on the runway and let you just kind of climb nice and normally up. So there, there, are, there, are, there are techniques that you can use to help blunt 
uh, blunt the response of the immune system, but you're never going to eliminate the response of the immune system. And that's not something you want to do. Because if you, if you totally take away your immune system's responsiveness, then you're going to be more susceptible to, you know, overwhelming infection. Because it's, it's, it's going to take, it, your infection is going to be way far down the road before your body ever decides, oh, I better be worried about this. And by then it's like, the Germans have already taken over Paris, you know. It's yeah, like, exactly. Like Without that. a warning to let us know that we need yeah. to get out of a place, we'd be right back where we were yeah. again. Yeah. Once you've stimulated, your immune system is, has, has a, a remarkable memory. <laughs> And that's the good news and the bad news. The, the good news is it has a remarkable memory to keep you out of trouble. The bad news is if it has an over exuberant response. And so what I try to do and what we should, I, I think the, the mechanisms that we need to take with folks like us that are mold toxic sensitive or mold sensitive is not getting rid of it, but how do we manage it? You're never going to eliminate the mold sensitivity. We're only going to be able to manage it. One of the key factors of that with any environmental illness is avoidance. Avoidance is the one thing that we all can do individually to minimize our exposure and our response. What would you say to uh, those who claim that your flight, fight or flight response, your fear of this is such a driving force that you shouldn't focus on avoidance, you shouldn't obsess about it because that becomes your illness. I would, I would politely suggest to them that they better take their head out of their backside and <laughs> like think about this. I am all about keeping your hand off the fire alarm in the brain. However, there's, there are real fears and there are constructed fears. I mean, they're, they're, I mean if, if, if you're worried, if you're living on a country dirt road and you're worried about a freight train bearing down on, on, on top of you, that's probably an irrational fear. If, however, you're living next to the train yard and your little two-year-old is out running on the tracks, that's a very real fear that you ought to, you know, that, that you ought to be concerned that they're going hit, to get hit by a train. So, I mean, if, if you have done what you can in terms of I've had, you know, I, I've, I've, taking care of my windows are sealed and you know I, I don't have any mold exposure and my humidity level is below 55 percent throughout the house and and you know I've, I've done all the mitigating factors within my home i know i have i'm living in a safe environment then you know sit back and relax does that mean i might not want to walk into that building over there that that looks like it's got you know the the the, the gutters are falling off the roof or i'm seeing a mold stain when i walk into the restaurant you want to turn around and walk away from that. That's a real fear. That, that's a rational fear. There's nothing irrational about that for a mold sensitive patient. And it is, yes, the fight or flight is, is, is a real thing and, and it can aggravate your problem, but it's not going to be the cause of the problem. It is not the problem. The problem is mold and your sensitivity to it. Well, thanks for explaining that. That is absolutely perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, do you have to do a lot of education with your patients to help them understand, hey, look, if you're walking into an area and you feel something reminiscent of your past symptoms, this is your reactivity talking to you? Well, that's that's usually if, if you're here from your, you know, if you're here as one of my stain heel patients, it's like, yeah, this this you get that, you get that before you, I mean, you get that when you come in and you get that before you leave and you get it several times while you're here. Yeah. Um, if, if you're if you're somebody that you know you're you're a local and you've, you've come in and we've treated you for mold you're, you're also getting it but then when when things but it's it's always you know hey doc i'm feeling it you guys say okay what did you do where did you go what building did you walk in oh geez i you know this is where i, I went out to vale and i thought it was nice because it was vale colorado but you know it was just like the room had the paint peeling off from around the, from around the window or yeah, it's just. Do you see yeah. a lot of people who complain about electronic sensitivity? Yes, uh, I do. And between stachybotrys exposure and electronic sensitivity. Well, I think the 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 common and Dr. Bill Ray, who was one of the you, know, you probably heard his name. Uh, his his firm belief was that electrochemical electromagnetic frequency sensitivity or EMF sensitivity was a direct offshoot of, uh, 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 of environmental toxicity. 
So, and Tim, it didn't make any difference if it was mold, metals, or 112,000 different chemicals that we could be exposed to. It just, it was a direct extension of that. There is really good literature out of Europe that shows there's about 20% of people that can be primarily uh, uh, affected by EMFs. Now, here's the common denominator. Remember that thing called glutathione? That, that you need to dump the toxins. Well, glutathione is a is just one of the singularly best antioxidants in the face of, of the earth. To me, it, it is the perfect antioxidant because it can donate its electron. It will find another glutathione molecule that has donated its electron and, and make this kind of like this. They'll, they'll just hold hands and walk out of life together and not cause any further damage or, or, or require stealing an electron from anybody else. However, EMFs, I mean, if you talk to engineers, uh, they say, well, cell phones can't cause you cancer if, if they're not heating the tissue. Well, that may be true, but what EMFs do do and has been well documented is that they interfere with the voltage-gated calcium channels on the cells. And these channels allow an influx of calcium into the cell and create these things called peroxynitrates and, and other oxidative stressors that utilize, uh, use up all your, that you use up all your uh, antioxidant supply, including glutathione. So if you're lacking glutathione or you need more glutathione to begin with and you're using it up quicker than you can make it, you're gonna have problems. Uh, so uh, is someone that is mold sensitive more likely to get EMF sensitive? I would say, yeah. And simply because you're, it's just another tax on your system and you're, and you're violating the basic balance between the reducing and the oxidative capacity of your body. Can you be mold sensitive and not EMF sensitive? Absolutely. Can you be EMF sensitive without mold sensitive? Absolutely. Um, it's about the glutathione factor. And, you know, there's so many ways to obtain glutathione, right? It's either through pill, through IV, through natural sources like asparagus. I mean, if your gut is completely wrecked or, or just in general, what is the best way to intake glutathione and intake it to where the body will actually absorb it and utilize it? Okay. Well, rem remember that if you take glutathione orally, if it's not a liposomal form, it's going to have to get broken down in those three component amino acid parts, transferred across the cell membrane and reassembled on the other side. If you, if you have mold toxicity, then you're, you're going to, you're, you're only going to be getting 40% of whatever it is you're taking because your, your production capacity has been reduced to that degree by the presence of the mold toxins. So I'm a big fan. If you're going to take it orally, it's got to be a liposomal form. If I, can give a trade name, my, my personal preference is, is Redisorb glutathione because if any studies that have been done on oral glutathione, if you look at where it was supplied by, Redisorb gave the university the glutathione, said here, you do the study, you know, and whatever your results are, your results are. We're not gonna try to influence the outcome. And they're the ones that have showed it reduces the oxidation of LDL. They're the ones that have shown that, that, in, uh, that, that in HIV patients that had mycobacterium resistant uh, um, uh, infection that, that giving glutathione rebalanced the TH1 with TH2 and they overcame the infection. They're the ones that have shown that if you, if, if you have equi, equal molar adult, uh, dosages of oral versus IV, you're going to get 60% of what you get IV by taking it orally. For the same dose. So if you got 500 IV and 500 orally, you're going to get you're going to get the same blood level with that oral 60% of what you would have gotten IV. Is IV preferable? Yeah, absolutely. But I like if you're going to take it orally, take a liposomal form. IV is preferable. You can even do it nebulizing. Uh, I have my COVID patients nebulizing glutathione along with silver to prevent the lung issues. Does a remarkable job. I've used it to break asthma attacks. I've used to break bronchiolitis in kids. It's just, it's, it's I just, people ask me, you know, I, I tell people, you know, what, what, somebody asked me a question once, you're going to be trapped on a desert island. What, what are five things you want to bring with you? And I want, I, I, I want a knife, I want a K-bar knife. I want a military type knife. I, I you know, I, I want a flint to, to start a fire. Uh, I want a water filter. I want glutathione and I want vitamin C. <laughs> 
thank you so much, Dr. Bowerschmidt. And, you know, we, we've gone beyond the hour and we don't oh. want to take your time. But, um, you know, we are just, we're, we love this conversation. And, you know, when we organize conversations with people, we never know who we're going to get on and we never know what their thought process is. And you know what I mean? It's just, mm -hmm. it's always such a breath of fresh air when we get people like you who are, who understand what's going on, who cut through the bullshit and who are not mm -hmm. on the side of the people who are trying to keep everything under wraps because we've had those people on, believe it or not. Um, and so, you know, in the future, we might be doing some symposiums or educational outreach, and we'd love, love to have you on. Love to do it. Uh, to, to me, to me, being, being, a, being a, a physician, you know, the original definition of a physician was teacher. And, and I, take that, <clears throat> I take that very seriously. Whether I'm teaching people, other doctors, patients, I don't care. Just the word needs to get out. People need to start using their brains more. <laughs> Absolutely. We need more people like you. And so thank you so much. We'll reach out in the future. And um, if there's anything else you'd like to say or how our audience members can go ahead and find you, please go ahead and plug in your information. Well, yeah, it says www.deeperhealing.com. There's a whole plethora of information there that, about molds and environmental illness and just how to live life a little healthier. Uh, please <laughs> come visit. Thank you so much. And let Danielle uh, know that she was really pleasant and, and so awesome just coordinating this, this interview with you. I really, I really liked her. She was so ecstatic. She was like, podcast? She's, yes, let's get them on. She, she, is, she, is, she has made deeper healing what it is. And so I, had to, I, I knew what I needed to say, and she figured out a way for me to say it. So I, I wouldn't be anywhere without her. <laughs> Fantastic. And if, and I'm sure you have um, other doctors or experts in your corner, if you would be willing to share um, their information so we can connect with them, so we can do interviews, that would be fantastic too. I could reach out maybe to Danielle to figure that well, out. Lynn, Lynn Patrick would be somebody that I would definitely talk to. Uh, Lynn Patrick, she's a naturopathic physician. Uh, she runs EMEI, which is the Environmental Medicine Education Institute. Uh, she's past president of the National Association of Environmental Medicine. I think she's still on the board for them. Uh, she'd be a good, and she's, she has she have resources at the yin yang. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. And, you know, there is one more thing before I go that I did want to ask you. And this is mm -hmm. a question that we get over and over again, and mm -hmm. it breaks my heart because I never have an answer for them. Where can people go? to get well if they need to leave. Is there a place in the US or Mexico where people can leave to that isn't extremely costly where they can seek refuge for a period of time to get well? I'm just curious. Well, well actually that, that, that's, uh, I mentioned we have people coming in. We've had people coming in from across the country and I've had conversations with people in Great Britain and Australia as well. As a matter of fact, we've got somebody here now from Hawaii and South Carolina. So they've come all this way, and uh, we we do have some mold-free environments that we in, we we've had houses inspected, and actually one of them was a previous patient who bought a condo on the beach, so she had someplace safe to hide. <laughs> um, uh, that uh, and we can we can get them better and on the road, and then teach them what they need to know so that they can create a safe space back at home. Perfect. Yeah, I'll go ahead and refer you because at this moment in time, um, you know, there there isn't a location. We had Dr. Jaff on our Jaffe. Jaffe. Yeah, and he was saying that some person had donated her property, and it was like in Virginia or something, but that no longer exists. Yeah. So yeah. I think the number one thing is, and I don't know if this is something that we all want to think about or come together to build or create, is like a community where people can go temporarily to heal. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like the most in-demand, in-need thing. Mm -hmm. and that, that, is, that is actually, that is actually a, a dream um, that, that we have, and, and I've been trying to, you know, I started this practice, uh, you know, I started a new practice when I was 65 years old. It's like, I got to be out of my mind, right? Um, <laughs> that's, how, that's how positive an influence Danielle can be. Um, <laughs> taught me out of retirement. But that, that's been the ultimate dream is to have, uh, you know, to, to create an area that, that has a healing center. And my, my wife is very big on trying to find uh, a healing community where, where people can, where, where you have a center like Deeper Healing uh, as, as, a, as available and people can build their homes in a 
positive environmentally friendly manner using things like magnesium oxide for drywall and uh, and looking at different uh, models like hempcrete or, or things that are that are mold resistant uh, building structures and using you know the, the the type of flooring and just all all this uh, all this stuff that makes a, a home mold safe or mold safer <laughs> if there's any if there is a carbon molecule available mold can grow given the right temperature and humidity so it's uh, any place that we can thrive mold can thrive and the only thing we can control is moisture so the, the the more we can limit its access to moisture the less mold we'll have in our world but it's you know there's there's probably there's last guess was uh 300,000 known mold species guesses there's probably over a million um and we haven't counted we haven't even begun to count the fungi yet <laughs> um, so yeah uh, um we're finishing up a publication right now on the theory that Eric has. And so once we send you that publication, that's going to really throw the a wrench in the mix when, yeah. when it comes to home building. Yeah, the good, the good news is there's only about 14 different species that commonly grow indoors. But of those 14, or, or of those 14 groups, there's over, you know, 200 species. Some more or less toxic, some more toxin promoting, some more allergy promoting, some frankly pathogenic. Um, but so the good news is that we, we, I think we, with the right building material and the right preventative maintenance, you can have, you, you can have a safe home to live in, uh, but finding it and, and, you know, having a community built around it is, I think is, is the ideal. And, you know, and the interest and just speaking of building, you know, I, I used to live in South Florida and we have much less mold problem there than we do here in South Carolina. And the reason is how we build. Uh, and, and North America, and specifically Canada and U.S., are the only stick building places in the world. Everybody else uses stone or mortar or, or some other less mold resistant bacteria, but or less mold resistant or more mold resistant material. But in Florida, everything's built on a slab with CBS construction or cinder black and stucco, which is which is more mold resistant than all the wood that we use in the Carolinas on top of you know on top of crawl spaces or basements and it's just we, we're just and and we build the buildings tight but not not positively pressurized so air leaks in through the windows and um, the, it's the interface between the moist external air and the dry internal air and the temperature so the dew point becomes critical and so you can have your perfect temperature and humidity in the middle of your room but it's at the interface that that is important and so if, if you're if your room temperature is 74 degrees which should not be mold specific but you get to the window and that 74 degrees hits that that cool or that that warm moist air from outside and the dew point 75 degrees you create condensation and you get mold growing in your windows even though you you're not you're not noticing it in the middle of your room so that's all building issues or if you put the if you put too big of an air conditioning unit uh, and you you know why well, two tons is good three tons is better well no because three tons doesn't dehumidify the air sufficiently it cools it but doesn't dehumidify it sufficiently so you don't you have a shorter runtime and more propensity to grow mold and you know not you know leave your don't leave your blower on on all the time because all your because what what you're doing is, is you're not leaving time to to drain any condensation out of the pan and, and out of the out of the condensing unit into the pan and out the door it just, just keeps blowing the the, all I condensate through your ductwork that then grows mold. So I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, the um, reel me in, I, please I, I, reel me in. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to share well. something really quick with you that's kind of crazy and see if see what your thoughts are if you can make sense of it. I know we're like wrapping up and I probably shouldn't be circling back, but I have to tell you, in the last couple of years, we lost two houses because of mold. And so we moved into this house last February and there were no signs of water damage shortly after moving in. Like the week I moved in, I noticed every time I used my electric stove top, I was having like emergency type mold reactions. I couldn't find mold anywhere. I was looking everywhere. My mom sniffed inside of the cabinet closest to the oven. I somehow was nose blind to it, but she could tell that there was a mildew smell inside the cabinet mm -hmm. and 
and something must have spilled in there years prior before we bought the house and there was like mold there was no surface growth it just looked like a little bit of maybe almost like an oil stain like olive oil an olive oil stain mm -hmm. is what it looked like i had no smell associated with it when the oven was off i had no reaction to the area mm -hmm. but only i'm sorry not the oven the stove because I could use mm -hmm. the oven and not have a reaction. But if I use the stove, the electric stove top, with that cabinet right there, mm -hmm. I mean, I was feeling like I needed to run out of the house. Like my heart was going to explode through my chest. We finally narrowed it down to this cabinet. We just ripped the cabinet out of the wall when we figure it out and we toss it outside and boom, the stove top doesn't bother me anymore. What mm -hmm. the hell do you make of that? Am I crazy or what, Doc? No, 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 you're not crazy at all. And, and if, you, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. One, I'd ask you, where was your vent for your stove? Did you, did you have a vent? Yeah, there's a vent on top of it. Okay, that. and I would be willing to bet you that the vent probably, it was either in what was created a, a negative pressure and allowed air from the outside in and the vent may not your, your pipe may not have been connected well to your fan and allowed the moisture to, to propagate the mold, even that small amount of mold. But the, the thing that, why, why when you turn the stove on is because whenever you start to deprive the mold, either try to dry it, like you turn your stove on, or um, if it gets crowded by other molds, it increases its spore formation and its toxin production. So every time you turn the stove on, it was a drying agent and the mold went, whoa. <laughs> but it was already fully dried because there was no wet, damp area. I mean, it looked like it must have happened years. Well, like it, years may, it, it, it may have. And in that case, then you're, you're looking at that dead mold can be just as toxic, if not more so than wet mold. Uh, yeah, definitely. And, and, and what you did is when you heated it, you just dried it further and it broke off in chunks as opposed to just, you know, little bitty pieces. So you think the heat made it break off from inside the cabinet? If it was if it was already dead, that would be my guess. Yeah, if it was still live, then and, and it may have been live behind it. You know, what you mold's kind of like roaches. If you see one, you got a hell of a lot more than what you see. Yeah, no, nothing was visible, and I couldn't smell anything. Mm -hmm. But even after you ripped out the cabinet, well. So I believe the problem was under the baseboard of the cabinet that was ripped out. So when we ripped mm -hmm. out the cabinet, the structure behind the cabinet was absolutely perfect. There was no moisture okay. buildup well, build yeah. on the wall. It was just, it was the baseboard. So the kick plate of the cabinet mm -hmm. where you'd rest things on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it didn't even look like waterlogged or soggy or warped, how you would see well, water damage. It yeah. just looked like someone maybe years prior had spilled some olive oil and instead of wiping it up, it maybe just absorbed. And mm -hmm. it didn't it didn't look like wet or anything. And like there was nothing on the surface of growth. So whatever it was had to have been like absorbed into that kick plate. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like flour budding from the roots of the surface. Well, I said dry mold can, is, is as toxic, if not more so than wet or, or live mold. So that, that may have been the issue and just kicking on your stove, just dried it further and precipitated the breakdown. Um, I, you know, don't know, I, I suspect you may have had more of a mold problem that you're able to see. Because remember, you know, mold spores are like three microns. You're not going to see them with the naked eye. And mycotoxins are 0 0.3 microns. So they, 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 can, they, they can be aerosolized and, and you're not, you, know, you can have hidden mold behind a drywall and you won't see any mold, but you'll have the effect of the mycotoxins because the mycotoxins will get through that drywall where the mold spores cannot. Do you think They're, there could have been any interaction between the actual electricity of the stovetop and something coming from the mold? Don't know. Um, I would have to, I'd have to think about that one for a while. Um, I, it was just, a, it was a strange experience. So yeah, unless, you, uh, unless you're electromagnetically, <laughs> unless you're electromagnetically sensitive at the same time, you're mold sensitive and the combination of the two just pushed you over the edge. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Cause you got a lot of resistance coils and electric stovetops. Yeah, it just doesn't bother me anymore now that the cabinet. Oh, you got rid. You got rid of half your. You got rid of half your problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's now under manageable conditions. Yeah, it 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 is a lot better now. Yeah, yeah. I thought I was gonna. Yeah. 
but all of you should be taking glutathione every day. I mean, glutathione should be your best friend because if you are exposed to the toxins, you'll dump them easier. I take it every day. I get a, I, I have my nurse hook me up to an IV once or twice a week and just shoot me, <laughs> shoot me 20 cc's. <laughs> like, I ain't screwing around with this stuff anymore. I've done my time. <laughs> well, thank you for your time today. Sure, my pleasure. Call me again. We will. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Don't don't stop the recording. I'm gonna do the closing. Okay. okay. I'll see you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We had Dr. Bowerschmidt on. It was a wonderful conversation. He he gets it, you know, he really gets it. And I'm so glad that we actually have a physician on that does. So we look forward to working with you in the future. And thank you again. Please like, share, comment on our content. Please check out our educational group. It's very low cost, and we offer a lot of information on how to manage hypersensitivities. So please check that out. Somebody lost, lost their bandwidth. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you know what? Um, uh, you know, we're we're actually going to be putting out a publication. Um, Eric has a really interesting theory about nanoparticles actually causing a rise in mold toxicity and issues in the environment. And uh, we'll go ahead and send that to you and just yeah. see what you think. Maybe we could just talk about it one day yeah. um, because we're, we're starting to see this is more than just a building issue. It's actually an, an environmental issue. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's just our theory, you know, we, we have to study it of course, but um, it's pretty interesting and I think you might like it. Yeah, love to, love to read it. Cool. So we won't take any more of your time.